So also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, this strong Indo-French collaboration that has been built over the last years. I have been a huge beneficiary of this. And uh, I thank everyone who has been part of this uh, collaboration. So in one of the visits, uh, Paul uh, asked me, let's uh, discuss something. Uh, <laughs> so I said I, I was working on something, uh, an extension of what I did uh, with diagonal constraints, whatever that means. I said, Paul, it's very difficult. Uh, I'm not going to. But then Paul said, uh, OK, no, I mean, it's OK, but you just tell me. OK, <laughs> let's just discuss it. And then we started discussing. So he actually listened to the entire thing. And then uh, slowly, uh, his first reaction was, we should clean this up. OK, so as usual, uh, with uh, so let's first clean it up. So and he got in, you know, nicer definitions, which actually helped us, uh, you know, get new observations about this entire thing. So it's been very influential working with Paul, and I get a much clearer idea of what I was doing before. And uh, <laughs> so I thank you for this, and I also look forward. So we also co-advised a PhD student. So that was a great experience for me. So I will learn all the advice that you gave both me and Shine. And I will implement it for the next students and so on. And uh, so just one small thing, sorry for this long, uh, longish, uh, you know, intro. So I just want to say a few words about uh, Paul's, uh, you know, Indian uh, experiences. So he's, so we all know he has been to India several times. And he also, he behaves like an Indian in India. So he uh, rides the scooter, the car, in every, uh, you know, like uh, honks. He does everything. And he also like bargains with, uh, negotiates with people. And like, he lives the Indian uh, life, I should say. And then uh, he's happy with all spicy food. He gets very annoyed if uh, in a restaurant, if someone looks at him and says, sir, do you want less spice? So he will be absolutely no. <laughs> Full spice. <laughs> yeah. But there is only one thing that uh, he has not learned yet. And I hope in the next years uh, he will learn uh, the one thing that he has not learned is the Indian accent. So, so whenever he orders uh, white pasta, he gets red pasta for some reason. And whenever he orders grape juice, he gets orange juice. So that's the one thing you need to you know, train yourself in. Otherwise, uh, you're like, uh, <laughs> you can just uh, shift to India. I mean, <laughs> OK. So thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I, I really enjoy working with you. And I really look forward to working with you in the future. Yeah. OK, so now uh, let me do a context switch and uh, become very serious about uh, the, the work. So I wanted to talk about three papers. And I didn't know how to give a common title. So I just uh, gave a kind of a template, like a PhD thesis title, some recent advances in time automata verification. So as the talk progresses, we will see what exactly I would like to talk about. So I want to start with something very old. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, this was even before time automata was born the way we know it. Okay, so this was in 89. David Dill had written a paper where he had defined a timing automaton. So there, so the timing constraints were given using timers. Okay, so on an action, you set a timer to some value. So here you set it to say something between one and three, and you let the timer go down. And then whenever there's a timeout, you do an action. I mean, you can ask for timeout as a guard. So you do B when there is a timeout. And then in the same transition, you reset the time. I mean, I'm used to saying reset. You set the timer to one again, okay? So this, as you can see, so this looks at, this gives you sequences where the distance between A and B is something between one and three. And between every B, one time unit has elapsed. So you set the timer, it uh, times out. You set the timer, it times out and so on. So here are his results about these automata with timers. He has you know, given a symbolic enumeration algorithm using difference bounded matrices. We call them zones now, okay? Uh, it was already there in 89. And he even proves that the enumeration using timers terminates. 
Okay, so it's like a finite, I mean, it's, it's an algorithm. You will see why I have highlighted it, you know, later. So here is, a, here is just an example to see why this works. You see, so I start with this automaton with timers. Let me add some dummy timers just to illustrate the point. Okay, so here I have added a new clock, sorry, new timer, which is set to some value between zero and infinity, but it's never used again, okay? So if I want to compute the reachable configurations in a symbolic way, so I will start with this P. So initially you see that both of them are undefined. So they are, they are not there yet. They are started in this action A, okay? And so what happens in this action A? Tx becomes one and Ty takes some value between zero and infinity. So you see that, so there is no real order between Tx and Ty. So they are just some independent uh, constraints between, okay? So what happens when you do, so initially Tx is one and Ty is anywhere here. So what happens on a B? So you wait till Tx moves down to zero, okay? And at that time, you take this action B. But you see that when Tx is zero, still Ty can be any value. Because if you had started with, you know, five and one, at zero, six would still be like, I mean, you will have, uh, you will have, you know, x comma zero for every, every possible combination, okay? So the result of this is that when you start with this configuration, on doing a B, you end up with the same zone, as if you know what they are, okay? So this is like a representation of this automaton with timers. Fine. So you keep this in mind. So then comes uh, in 90, Alur. And he says, uh, no, let's do a reformulation. And instead of looking at timers, let's work with clocks. So we are going to reverse the way timing time is going to go. So he introduces this notion of a clock, clock reset, and a clock guard. So this is the same thing. At A, you reset X and Y. And at B, you check for x equal to one, you reset x, check for x equal to one, reset x. So it's achieving the same, you know, behaviors. So I'm quoting uh, Alur's PhD thesis here. So, so he says that apart from some technical conveniences in developing the emptiness algorithm and proving its correctness, the reformulation allows a simple syntactic characterization of determinism for time automata. Okay, so I tend to agree with it. Not that uh, I have a choice, but still I would say that I tend to agree with it. So the first thing clearly, so with the, with the, with the, when clocks were, you know, given, so he gave this idea of a region automaton. And that has been really useful. So almost every decidability result that we know of that deals with time automata, we use regions, okay? The second thing, you see like to characterize determinism, all you need to do is, I mean, uh, you have two guards which are disjoint, x less than one, x bigger than or equal to one. So in a, an automaton with timer, that kind of a notion is not there. So a guards are not first class citizens. There is just a setting of a timer and a timeout. So getting determinism, you need to add something to the syntax. So, and as we know, like uh, over the last years, there have been several theoretical results and several uh, practical verification tools that dealt with timed automata. Okay, so let's stick to timed automata. There is one useful property which got lost in this process. Okay. And that is the termination of uh, the symbolic enumeration. Okay. So if you remember in the timer automaton, we just had something, you know, A and then a B loop. Here that doesn't work. So on doing an A, you come to a config, I mean, you come to a set of valuations that satisfies Y equal to X, okay? And then when you do a B, both X and Y have gone to one, and then you reset X. So you create a difference of one between Y and X. And when time elapses, that stays, okay? And the second time you do a B, when X is one, Y is two. So when you reset X, your Y minus X becomes two. And then uh, that continues.
so in some sense, somehow uh, the clock x, I mean the x minus y can take arbitrary values. So you see that the clock lives even after it is useful. So and that seems to be a problem. Okay, so the the rest of uh, you know, okay, uh, since then the work has been to figure out how to terminate this symbolic enumeration. Okay, so in ninety eight. Uh, Dawes and Tripakis formalized this enumeration as the zone graph computation. Okay, and then they reused this DBMs uh, given in the Dill's paper. So as far as I know, Dill's paper gets cited because of DBMs, and I have never, uh, until recently, I never noticed that there was a timer, and then it terminated, and so on. So I find it very surprising, and uh, okay, and they also figured out that. Uh, this does not terminate in general. Okay, so here are a bunch of results which helped with the termination process. So the first thing, as is, I mean, it's uh, we don't need to know what this is. Okay, so they created some mechanism with which uh, the termination, I mean, the enumeration can terminate, and then developed this tool called Kronos. And then later, Patricia showed that uh, there is an error in this. Uh, in the proof, and uh, in fact, the implementation was not correct when there were diagonal constraints. So she even showed that an extrapolation is not possible when you have diagonal constraints. So later in 2004, uh, Patricia Kim and uh, co-authors gave a better way to terminate this procedure. Okay, because we need faster termination in order to make it, you know, ap applicable. And that has that is still the default option in Upal, and it is it it shows dramatic improvement compared to the previous uh, works. So in 2012, this is the work that I was talking about, which I uh, presented in LSV. So instead of using an extrapolation, we made use of what is called a simulation. So we just uh, and then that is the basis of the tool T Checker, which is an open source tool developed in Bordeaux. For time automata verification. Fine. So just a quick summary. So I have told you that what are timers, and I've said that symbolic enumeration does not terminate. Sorry, symbolic enumeration does terminate. And with clocks, it does not. And in the last 25 years, we have been studying methods for quick termination with clocks. And there is good tool support, several tools, all of them use clocks and use zones and so on. So now what is this talk about? So in the first part, so we will look at two methods to ensure fast termination of this symbolic enumeration. Okay, so that is the first part. And as a second part, we will look at a unified model which incorporates timers, clocks, and event clocks. I will come to it. Uh, so let me start with uh, the first part, which is G simulation, which is worked with uh, Cheyenne and uh, Paul. Okay. So I'll call it the depth challenge. Okay. So you are you have your automaton and you are computing these zones, and then you want to have a finite depth to this computation. Okay. So how do you ensure this? So you want to construct a finite prefix which contains all the reachable control states. So we are interested only in reachability. Let's. Okay. And the way we want to achieve this is to make use of simulations. So when I come to this node, I want to check if there is a better node that is already present. If yes, I want to discard this. Okay. So in other words, I want to, I, I want to stop enumerating this if it is simulated by something already existing. So what is the simulation? Okay. So this is a relation, a binary relation between nodes of this form. Okay, So I want to say that this node is simulated by this node if for every successor from the smaller node, there exists a successor from the bigger node which can simulate the small successor. Okay, So in some sense, what this ensures is that every path that I can play from here is present from the bigger node. Okay, so 
the algorithm is just compute, just enumerate your reachable configurations. And whenever you find something which is already simulated, you stop. Okay, you discard that. Okay. And of course, we want this relation to be nice in some way. And what is nice? It has to ensure that this computation is finite. And uh, you see that, oops, this, this operation is used multiple times. Each time you see a new node, you will be checking its simulation to various existing nodes. And so you better have a fast algorithm for this. Okay, so these are the two conditions that we require. And I will briefly try to tell you how we achieve this. Okay. See, the first thing is, so what are our resources? The constraints present in the automaton, they are the ones that are guiding the paths in the automaton. So somehow, the first step is we want to compute a set of relevant constraints at each state of the automaton and use that to define a concrete simulation relation. Okay. So here is how you compute relevant constraints. So this is done by a static analysis of the automaton before you start the enumeration. So here are the states. So if you see at Q0, so x bigger than or equal to 4 is relevant because you are, you are immediately going to you know, apply that. Similarly, after a while, you, will, you are going to see x bigger than or equal to 6. Okay, So these two constraints are relevant. But then, why is this y bigger than or equal to 1 not relevant? Because if you look at the path to that constraint, there is a reset of y before you actually see y bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, So in some sense, the reset is masking the constraint from the current state. So you do not put it here. So you see that this is a simple fixed point computation. You compute all the constraints that you can reach, modulo resets. Okay, and you are not generating new constraints. So you're, you're only computing something which is present in the automaton. So this is a finite procedure. So once you have that, so here is the simulation. So this is, uh, I mean, I, I, I should thank Paul for this definition now because, uh, so he asked, let us first write down what we want. Okay, So this is what we want. So if I'm given a set of constraints, so when do I say that a valuation V, a valuation is uh, you know, a value for every clock, is simulated with respect to V prime. Okay. Let me just read this out. You look at every constraint in your set, and you look at all possible time delays. So whenever V plus delta satisfies this constraint, you want your bigger valuation to also satisfy the constraint on this delay. Okay, so whenever V can do something, V prime can also do the same thing. So this is the definition of the simulation relation. Okay, even though it looks, you know, kind of abstract. So let me just give you a couple of examples. I will not go through all of them. I'll just show some illustrative ones. So let me assume that I have a single clock and I have this constraint x bigger than or equal to 5. Okay, so here are my valuations. This is my v and this is my v prime. Okay, so I want to show to you that this 4.2 is simulated by 4.9 with respect to this constraint. Okay, so to see why, at this point, x bigger than 5 is not satisfied because x is 4.2. So in order to satisfy this, it has to elapse at least 0.8 time units. Okay. So if I do 0.8 or anything above, I will become bigger than or equal to 5. And if I apply the same 0.8, of course, I will go bigger than or equal to 5. Because 4.9 is bigger than 4.2. Okay. So whenever this can satisfy the guard, this will also satisfy the guard. So let us look at a non-example. Like this is 4.2 and this is 4.1. So let me add 0.8 again. And if you add 0.8 to this, this will still be 4.9, which does not satisfy the guard. OK? So a more, uh, you know, so you know uh, the way we write it is that v will be simulated by v prime if either, OK, my v prime x is less than or equal to vx. Uh, did I write it the right way? Oh, sorry. So this is the upper bound. Okay, okay, sorry. So let me look at uh, a lower bound. 
Okay. So sorry for the x and the y uh, confusion, but assume this is x. Yeah. So the point is, if we have a constraint like this to check whether v is simulated by v prime, it boils down to two simple constraints. Either v prime y is bigger than v of y, or v prime is already above d, in which case, you know, it's anyway going to satisfy it. You don't care whether v is on which side of v prime. Okay, so that is the basic idea. So the point is, this kind of an abstract definition can be concretized. Okay, and uh, using this observation, you can also give, you know, like, uh, a simulation for zones. Okay, so you say that Z is simulated by Z prime for if for every valuation here, there exists a V prime which simulates it. Okay, it's just extending from valuations to zones. Okay, so in summary, you just compute some constraints from the automaton and then apply this definition. And this definition can also be, you know, algorithmized, if that makes sense, okay? So, and then uh, we have shown that it's a finite relation. It's coarser than all the previously known simulation relations. And so a good bulk of the work is hidden inside this uh, statement here, because uh, so given a Z and a Z prime, checking if Z is simulated by Z prime is not completely obvious. So we need a method to, and in particular, we need an effort to come up with an efficient method, it's not very simple, but it there is a method, okay? And it's as good as, you know, checking for just inclusion. It's not that, it's not more, uh, more uh, complex. And with this understanding, we were able to extend this simulation to diagonal constraints as well. Okay, so this does not violate uh, Patricia's result because she says that extrapolation is not possible, but still a simulation indeed uh, was possible. What was missing was the test. And then, uh, so we also extended the test to the case of diagonal constraints, but caveat. There, the test is NP complete, okay? But then we gave uh, some optimizations that can work, you know, in, in practice, as you call it, okay? So that is the, yeah. So that is the first part you know, the sub part of the first part of the talk, okay? So I have, uh, uh, I mean, so now you know one method for, so the depth challenge has been met. So using a G simulation, you can get a finite depth, finite prefix, okay? So now I'm gonna talk about a second uh, way to ensure fast termination. So this is joint work with uh, Govind and uh, colleagues from Bordeaux. So this is called the local time semantics. So I will. Uh... So, I mean, yeah, we have to show that it terminates. So the point is that uh, if you look at these, the simulation relation, and if you look at the downward closure of the simulation relation, it will be a union of regions. Okay. So if Z is simulated by Z prime, all the regions that intersect Z will be intersecting Z prime. Okay. So you can kind of, so there cannot be more than two power number of regions. You know, the, the length of the part. But in... I mean, in practice, you don't even hit that uh, bound. Okay, fine. So the next challenge that uh, I would like to talk about, I, I will call it the breadth challenge. Okay, so what this is about, it's, so now we want to talk about networks of timed automaton, not just a monolithic single timed automaton. So here you have local actions and shared actions. Okay. And here, uh, whenever, I mean, a shared action is possible when all the participants are ready to fire that shared action, okay? And uh, and along with that, you have guards and resets and so on. So it's just a normal automaton network, but with time added to it. So let me show you one example. So look at this very simple network. 
Okay, there are two processes. So from P naught on an A, you're just resetting X. So clocks are local. So there are no shared clocks. Okay. And at Q naught, you're just resetting Y. Fine. So let's see what happens if you just explore the reachable configurations. So initially you're at P naught, Q naught, and you start with both the clocks being, you know, equal, X equal to Y. So when you do A, you are resetting X. So in any configuration, X will be less than or equal to Y because you would have elapsed some time here and X and Y would have gone somewhere. And then uh, you have reset X. So X will be less than or equal to Y. And then when you do a B, you are resetting Y. So Y will be smaller than the current value of X. So this AB maintains the order of resets. Okay. Similarly, if you do BA, you will get a different order of resets. So this leads to an explosion, okay? If these are just two actions and different interleavings of them lead to two different uh, zones. And of course, as you can imagine, if you have a network with you know just the, these kind of resets, each interleaving, so there are two power n interleavings and each interleaving will maintain a different order in which it was performed, okay? And uh, this is an issue. So how do we tackle this issue? So I'm just calling it the breadth challenge. So let's see, the main problem behind this is that even though the processes are you know, doing disjoint actions, so there is a, this notion of time which is common to them. So it's a global time. When this process is elapsing one time unit, the other process is also elapsing one time unit, okay? So and how does it affect? So for instance, suppose I had this guard here which said X is bigger than or equal to two. And I had a guard which says Y is less than or equal to one. So if I do A, both X and Y are bigger than or equal to two, because in the meanwhile, Y was also elapsing time. And after that, you cannot do a B, okay? But on the other hand, I can do a B first, and my X is still, you know, less than or equal to one, and then I can do A. Is that okay? So if I have guards like this, remember that both X and Y are moving synchronously. I can do Y followed by X, but not X followed by Y. Okay? So in some sense, a diamond is lost. Okay? And this is happening because time is common to all the processes. And so here is where uh, there was this very nice uh, semantics introduced in 98 of a local time semantics. So the point is that every process has its own local time. It can go at its own uh, pace. But whenever there is a common synchronizing action, all of them have to come to the same time before doing that action. They have to synchronize on their clocks. Okay. So this semantics was, I mean, I'll, I'll illustrate this uh, with this example. Okay, so here, I'm going to add two reference clocks to process P and Q. Okay, TP and TQ are going at their own uh, rate. So when you want to do an A, only TP moves. TP moves and TQ is staying at the same zero time. So after doing an A, you can still do B because your Y is still zero. Okay, you have not elapsed time at all in the other process. So now you elapse one time unit and you reach this configuration. So you reach the configuration where X is two and Y is one. You can also reverse it. You first elapse one time unit in the second process and then elapse two time units in the first process. So this does not touch the second process. Something that you do local to one process does not affect the other one. So it's like just a state change in the usual uh, network of automata. And uh, the result of this is that local delay actions are independent. So they, they give you, they commute. Similarly, actions with disjoint domains, they commute because the clocks are local. So reset, you cannot, one process cannot reset the clock of another process. So they are completely independent. So the point is that in local time semantics, if you do a run, all interleavings of that run will go to the same uh, configuration. Okay, and this is very useful Ah, I told it a bit too early. Uh, so the point is that, fine, you gave a new semantics. You gave more freedom 
But does it mean that you're going to look at, I mean, you're going to reach more control states? Because then this is not useful for the standard time automata semantics. So it turns out that that's not the case. So this local time semantics preserves the reachable states. And why so? It's just a simple uh, observation that whenever you do a local sequence, you can always reorder the sequence in such a way so that it can be played in a global time. So let me show you this. See, for example, if I have, if I do two time units here, and then I do one time unit here, and then I let both of them synchronize at three. Okay, you see that this is a synchronizing action. Both of them should be at the same timestamp. I can reverse it. I can do one followed by two followed by three. And when I do that, when I'm doing one, I can let the other process also elapse time. Okay, so this can be achieved using a global uh, semantics as well. The point is, once again, for every local run, there is a global run, which is an interleaving. So you do not see new states with this semantics. Okay, so just to point out, so we saw this local time semantics, it is sound for reachability and it has very nice independence properties. Ah. I have to do the same thing one more time in this direction, yeah. Huh. If you, this is the example. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um. I understand what you mean. Okay, okay, okay. No, no, but uh, no, no, no. See, so here you reached P1, Q0, P0, Q1, P1, Q1. See, one of the execution got cut in the process. Uh, so I understand what you mean. Uh, See, so see, essentially whatever you saw, okay, in the global version, something would have cut it. That's all. But there will be one thing which came. Something would have cut it in the last point. So this state will still be there. Okay. I mean, Maybe this will make it, I don't know, is this, uh, this is easier to see? Like, uh, if I have some sequence, I can always reorder that and come to the same state. So for any combination, I can come to the same state by just reordering the way in which I came there. Okay. Ah, um, Mm, yes, very good point. So I'm assuming there are no invariants. Okay. So, and for reachability, I mean, yeah, dealing with invariants is some work, but let's assume we have dealt with it. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. So, I mean, see, you can always pass the invariant to the, to the guard. Yes, I, I, I understand the, yes, but there is some work and Yes, yes, yes. It's absolutely, I mean, there is one appendix in Govin's thesis which deals with invariance. So, like, uh, what to do with invariance? Yeah, okay. With the, we are synchronizing with the reference clocks of the processes. So, for example, when you do C, both TP and TQ should have the same value. Like, if I elapse two time units here, and if I elapse one time unit here, 
I cannot. Oh. Why is it not working? Ah, there's some something here. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Ah, the meeting is being recorded by the person. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll just stop sharing this. Oh, it is recording good now. And why it's not sorry about the yes. Yeah, okay, good. It works. Yeah. So sorry, your question was. So when we do see both their both the reference times should be the same, whatever the value is, before they perform C. So for instance, if I do two here and if I do one here, so this process is here and this process is here, they cannot do C immediately. At least th this guy should wait for at least one time unit to come to two, and then both of them do it together. question was like if you reset one of the clocks uh -huh. um, when you synchronize you look only at the clock so you could have that no so when we synchronize we also look at the reference clocks yeah. yes 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 absolutely yes yes we also look at there's a tp equal to tq implicit constraint that we yes okay so let me just go ahead and uh, i can take more questions uh, later fine so the question is, now that we have the semantics, we want to enumerate using zones as we did in the global time. Okay. And the nice thing about this uh, enumeration is that all these interleavings will come to a same zone. Okay. This is what we wanted. Okay. So, inter I mean, we have the diamonds now. So is the problem solved? Take the local time semantics, do the zone. Is it okay? Everyone is happy. So not really. It turns out that, yeah, we have to come back to this question of termination because that's always an issue. So what about termination of this local zone computation? So here is an interesting example. After this, I'll just give the results. So here we have two processes, okay? And uh, so A is a local action to this process. B is a local action to this process, okay? And C is a shared action. See, each time you do an A, this process has to have elapsed one time unit. And each time you do a B, this process should have elapsed one time unit. And then when doing a C, once again, there is an X equal to one, Y equal to one constraint. So here is some kind of a mental exercise. So if I look at it in the global time semantics, what is the untimed language? What are the set of sequences that are possible? So let me tell you, suppose, I mean, uh, Now, remember that both of them are elapsing time at the same time. I mean, okay, uh, synchronously. So when I do an A, both X and Y will be at one, okay? So now, if you elapse a little bit further, you cannot do a B anymore, or you cannot do a C anymore, because Y would go strictly beyond one, okay? So at time T equal to one, both A and B need to have happened. Then once again, at time t equal to 2, both a and b need to have happened till at some point t equal to k, both of them are doing a c. Okay. So at each time stamp, at each time unit, both a and b happen. And at some point, it exits with a c. Now, what about the local time semantics? This guy can keep doing a's. Okay. And then before doing a c, the other person can catch up by doing the same number of Bs and then doing a C, okay? So what we get here 
is that in the global time, of course, it's a regular language, the untimed, because we have a region automaton construction and so on. So we get a regular language here. But in the local time semantics, we don't, we lose that. So the language that we have has the same number of A's. I mean, it's W C such that W has the same number of A's and B's. Okay. So what does this imply? You cannot hope for a finite region equivalence, or you cannot hope for a zone graph that preserves the untimed language. Okay. So yeah. In the in the local time semantics, so see, suppose I do K A's. And then I mean, so this process is at K. Maybe I'll just. So if I do A, 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 and so on, process P is at, let's just, is at four. Okay. And then suppose you want to do a C. Then you need the other person to catch up with you. Now, if the other person just elapses time, you cannot do a C because you want the Y to be one. both the local reference clocks should have the same value. Okay, so this one is four, TP is four, you want TQ to be also four. Okay, but if you don't do this action, Y will be four and then you cannot do C. So you're forced to do, you know, four Bs and then you, are, then you can do a C. Okay, fine. So this is the implication. So, but then uh, how do we deal with it is the question. So I'll just give the results. So in, uh, in, in 2019, we gave a different way to ensure termination. It's not a simulation relation. We call it a sync subsumption. I mean, it preserves reachability, but it does not preserve the untimed language. I hope so, okay? So, I mean, because, yeah, because as we see, we, it cannot, there cannot be a finite representation. And later, last year, we actually, we wanted a simulation because having a simulation also helps us with uh, adding partial order reduction methods. So we cannot add partial order reduction th to this kind of a thing. So we look for a simulation, but then we restricted the class of networks that we are looking for, okay? And uh, we call them bounded spread networks. I'll just give you one example of what this means. See, the point is that you don't want two processes to go very far apart and then do something and catch up, okay? So the point is that in every run, whatever a local run is, you should be able to, you know, adjust the time delays in such a way so that both the processes are always at a close distance, D, okay? So here is this example. If you see this example, if I look at A, B, I mean, I can see here, you see I did an A, but I somehow I kept this Y to be zero. So here, the difference was two, TP minus TQ was two. But that was really unnecessary. I could have made the other process elapse one time unit and still it will be able to do this. Okay, So I can keep them, I just needed a lag of one time unit between the processes in order to be able to do AB. Okay, so this network has a spread one, whatever. And uh, as we expect, this process has unbounded spread. So if I look at A power K, so this process has come to K. I cannot do anything. I can only move this thing up to one time unit. Because if I move it any further, I lose the ability to synchronize with it due to the guards. Okay? So I can, I have to maintain a spread of K minus one between these two processes. I mean, not K minus one, an unbounded spread between these processes. If I want to preserve the language, the untimed language. Yeah, so then one extra thing that we notice is that you can actually add some extra synchronizations and make every network into a bounded spread network. But you lose out on the concurrency. So you kind of fix an order between, so essentially this D will be like some kind of a time unit. Within this time interval, you allow concurrency, but beyond that, you do not allow, you do not allow this thing to go there. Okay, so that is the idea, fine. Okay, so this is the status. I just want to note, I mean, I, I would like to say that this is this is the one that is, it's implemented in T-Checker. And in our opinion, that is uh, 
that has the best uh, uh, you know results in terms of uh, you know the number of states explored and the timings okay so that brings me to the end of the first part of the talk i mean i'm i mean i let me not scare you the other one is very short so okay so in the second part uh, what we are going to do is we are going to quickly look at a recent work that we did with uh, akshay govind paul and uh, a master student aniruddha from iit bombay so we are look we, so it inspired by this timers okay so there was some work on timers it said that the zone graph is finite then we have the usual clocks and you apply all your simulations and you get a finite graph then there is another body of work on event clock automata where once again it's not easy to see whether the thing terminates or not and so there are non trivial proofs to show termination at you know so we decided why don't we look at a unified model and uh, so we call it generalized timed automata if you have a better name please let us know and uh, so what are the what is this model so this comes with two kinds of clocks one are called history clocks so what are they they are like usual clocks so they start with i mean they are initi i mean initially they are undefined and you can at any point reset that clock and start it and these clocks increase with time as you usually know the extra kind of clocks we call them future clocks what happens is initially they are all minus infinity and at some point you can set them to be some value which is negative and then once again they increase okay so it's not like a timer was decreasing this was leading to technical problems so let's assume that you set it to some negative value and then you still make it increase okay so what is the so i'll come to the advantages of this so th i'm just explaining it here so you have a, a release operation so you can first you know kind of start the future clock put it to some value and then you can uh, you know use a guard to kind of bring it to wherever you want it to it's like setting a timer to to 2 comma 3 okay so that is about future clocks and history clocks you have the same thing you just reset and you can ask for a guard as i said before now these future clocks help us to simulate timers and event predicting clocks so if you know what they are so there is this model of event clock automata where you can predict the time to the next event use that as a guard and uh, record the time since the last event use that as a guard and so on so the the point is that in under this model we can simulate you know all combinations and one of the main advantages of this reformulation is that you can use zones because if you see i'm setting a clock here i'm having a clock here as they delay the difference is going to be the same so whereas in a timer the timer is going like this the clock is going like this the difference is not the same so x plus y is possibly a constant but we want to work with zones okay so that's why we have this formulation and of course these future clocks are not allowed to cross this boundary okay so that is an implicit constraint inside the model so we have a so what is the result so we have this model of generalized time automata so first let's consider without diagonal constraints so we formulated zones for this model and a combination of you know all existing proofs we gave a simulation and we have a unified proof that sim i mean that generalizes the proof with timers the proof with clocks and the proof with event clocks okay so this one is one proof and then we looked at what happens when you add diagonal constraints to this model okay so it turns out that it becomes powerful and uh, it is undecidable and then uh, we identified some safe subset of this generalized automaton which can uh, you know be you know which we can deal with and so the restriction is not very uh, you know very uh, very high so the restriction is that whenever you are using clocks in a diagonal constraint they can be released only if they are at the zero point or they are undefined so something like like a timeout or undefined if you have this then you still stay within the realm of decidability 
And in particular, this covers, you know, timers, and it also covers event clock automata if you want to add diagonal constraints to it. Okay, that allows some modeling uh, convenience. Fine. And uh, we have a tool that implements this uh, GTA model. It extends T-checker. So you can play around with timers, event clocks, usual clocks. You can define your clock to be a timer, a clock, or whatever you want. So it allows these features. And if you want, so for instance, if you have a model which is a timed automaton and you want to model check an event clock specification, so you can directly do that. You don't need to convert the event clock into a normal timed automaton, do a product and, and for example, if you have a timer model and a specification which is given as a timed automaton, you can just apply this in the generalized timed automaton model. Okay, so that is the, so here is the summary of the talk. So I started with this, you know, recalling literature about timers, which says that automata with timers have a finite zone graph. Okay, I, I, I'm, I, I quite like this uh, observation, and I'm also surprised by the fact that this was hidden. So, I mean, at least it was hidden to me. I do not know if, uh, yeah, okay. And uh, so that has motivated the community to look at clocks, and there is a zoo of work uh, that deals with clocks. And in particular, I talked about G simulation, which is a way to stop the enumeration. And then I talked about a local time semantics with, which helps us give diamonds. And there are some technical issues with that. And finally, I talked about a unified model that can uh, you know, look at both timers and clocks and event clocks. Okay, So all of this is implemented in T-Checker. So that is the summary. I just have one more slide about future work perspectives. Or, you know. So I think it is useful to re-look at timers from you know, we need to investigate how the zones are when you have timers. Do Is there a gain if you have a model, you model it as a timer automaton, you model it as a normal timed automaton, does it give any gain? You know, this kind of experimental questions are there. That is with respect to timers. Now this local time semantics, so the main goal of the local time semantics was to add modern POR methods. So in uh, programs, there are lots of, you know, new deep or dynamic partial order methods considered. And uh, just shifting them to timed automata is not immediate. So, you know, stateless model checking and which have been very useful. So at least this local time semantics gives us a basis to start thinking about these questions. So that is one thing. And I think Igor, uh, uh, Frederick and uh, a PhD student have been working on that. So I do not know what is the status of uh, this. And uh, with Madhavan and another student at uh, CMI, we also looked at a local time semantics for negotiations. So negotiations are this model of uh, concurrency where the interactions between agents are the first class citizens. Okay, so and it's you do not define the model using states. You first say this is an interaction. After this, the agents go do this interaction. After this, the agents do this interaction, and so on. So there were two important features. I mean, according one is that many of the analysis questions become you know, by uh, reduced to a static analysis and they become P time with this negotiations model. Secondly, it provides a good modeling perspective for, you know, workflow style uh, situation. So we wanted to add, we, we looked at the second motivation, okay? And we wanted to add timing to it. So here there is one uh, twist to it. So instead of forcing all agents to synchronize in every interaction, we allow it as a freedom. So you tell me, you specify whether in this node, all of them should synchronize or not. So synchronization is added as a guard and instead of like an implicit semantics. And it turns out that if we do this, it becomes very powerful and we get undecidability. Okay, and then uh, we have to look for decidable subclasses and so on. So that is the part about local time. And uh, the other thing that is work in progress is with this generalized timed automata. So because of its definition, it is it makes it convenient to convert logics to this kind of automata because there are future clocks which can directly deal with future operators and you don't have to go via alternation. So this is, this is uh, work with, uh, okay. So this is ongoing. And then of course, see, once timed automata became 
you know, mature. And then there were other extensions to it, time, games, price time datometer, probabilistic time datometer, parametric time datometer. And there are tools for each of them, OK? So of course, one can uh, investigate what happens to these extended models with the, let's say, modern methods, which have been given for time datometer, OK? So these are some of the future questions that one can look at. Thank you for your attention. Long live India and France friendship.